the CEO of Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, Simon Harford, joined us to explain how his organization is assisting governments in the developing world to meet their energy ambition. Further on, he speaks about the challenges and gaps pertaining to energy access and transition, and the role of the private sector in creating a profitable economic model for low-income regions. African countries are obviously still pursuing their own development pathway. Uh, and so for energy, we see two particularly significant challenges that they're grappling with and we're, we're here to try and assist with. So one is energy access, uh, so still trying to bring uh, energy connectivity to, uh, to the hundreds and millions of Africans who don't have it. And it's not just the connection, it's also um, making sure that access is affordable, it's reliable, crucially that they can build their livelihoods off it, uh, whether that's sort of education, health, uh, women's empowerment and so on. So it's the quality of the access, not just having a connection. That remains a massive, massive problem for Africa. Uh, and then the related problem, of course, with the uh, momentum around the climate agenda is how do, how do countries do that in a green way? So how do they drive their growth, drive their development agenda, bring access to their citizens in a way that is as much as possible with renewable power? Um, and then other countries who've already got part of the energy sector on fossil fuel power how can they start to reduce that? Yes, absolutely. And we're also asking people to step away from their standard assets um, and move into something that requires heavy capital. And again, we're talking about economies that might not be able to afford it on their own. And we constantly hear conversations around uh, funding climate, you know, climate finance, but how just is it and uh, what more needs to be done in that area for it to be available truly uh, to scale up or even initiate these programs across uh, different economies in Africa? A lot more needs to be done and that's one reason why we exist is to, is to assist with everybody else who's trying to, um, trying to partner with countries on this. Uh, again, let's divide it into the energy access problem and the energy transition problem because they are they're related, but they are distinct problems. Energy access, in some ways, uh, the solution is less about large amounts of money. It's about trying to solve across a whole system of things that are not working and uh, correct those failures and those shortcomings across the whole system. Money is part of it, uh, but it's certainly not the whole answer. So if I just illustrate that, for example, with a country like Nigeria, which for Africa is the country with the greatest number of citizens still without access to power. Uh, so by quantity, it's the, it's the number one uh, country uh, needing solutions on this. Um, if you look at what's holding that back, and this is where we come in trying to assist, uh, is that you need to, you need to create more off-grid solutions for renewable power, uh, which can be located uh, where the grid doesn't reach or where the grid is not affordable. Uh, and that's where renewable power is fantastic at that because solar, for example, you can locate the solar generation off-grid where the demand is. Um, so first of all, you need to create the, uh, the, the, the what we call mini-grids, uh, which are uh, sort of small solar-based uh, generation uh, and the, the, uh, the system that gets those working. Secondly, though, um, the most viable way of making that sustain from an economic model is that that power is then put to productive use. So of course, if the power just lights a light bulb, that's important, but there's no earning from that, which means it's very hard to make this a sort of private sector, commercial, economic model, um, and that would be the most sustainable. So we also look on the, on the demand side of what's the use of power and how can we help to bolster that so that it drives livelihoods, it drives income, it could be linked to a small business, it could be linked to agriculture, it could be linked to a woman working from home, uh, creating her own livelihood. Then you start to get an economic model working. Um, but there are more challenges that need to be dealt with, which again, we're, we're seeking to assist with, uh, with partners. Uh, so some of the, uh, the supply of the electricity um, solutions is in hard currency, but of course, if it's generating revenue, it's in local currency. So you have a foreign exchange challenge. Uh, so we're also uh, working with partners trying to solve for local currency needs. You get other issues, which is the, the cost of this equipment. Um, when you're a small developer solving it in one community or one town or whatever, you don't have much purchasing power. 
and then you need the working capital to, uh, uh, to fund that. Uh, so we're trying to aggregate all these small private developers of renewable power to be bulk purchasing, which means, of course, it brings the costs down. Our pilot has already delivered about a 20% cost reduction in the purchase of that, uh, but also we can help them with working capital facilities. Um, and so if you look at all these different interventions that we and partners are, are trying to bring, you're starting to correct all the different challenges in the system and then the system starts to work. So that's just one illustration on the, uh, on the energy access side. That's a very interesting. Uh, so there's a lot of work that is being done and has to be done for the developing side of the world. Um, this is your, I would take this as your closing statement. Um, what do you think is the state of the developed world, the more advanced economies, when it comes to their transition and reduction in emission? It's a great question because this sort of occasion, everyone's very focused on the emerging markets and the developing countries. Uh, and we sometimes forget your point. Um, my view is that uh, the developed countries have also got big challenges on their hands with their energy transitions. These are really complicated uh, processes where you've got to shift whole sectors of the economy. You've got to have a government that is creating the enabling environment with new policies, new regulations. And that's all got to happen in synchronization. You can't, in a developed country, let alone in a developing country, you can't just close down your fossil fuel-based power generation without having already brought up to capacity your renewable power generation. That's all got to be done in synchronization. You can't build up your renewable power generation at scale until you've strengthened your grid. And you've got either storage solutions or grid balancing solutions, and you've got the generation in the right parts of the country. So these are, these are complicated sort of synchronization implementation requirements and uh, I think that developed countries are still very much grappling with that.